As we continue with our overview of the Constitution in Lecture 8, we'll be going through the shorter articles of the Constitution, Articles 4, 5, 6, and 7. But even though these articles are shorter, they're still very important. In fact, you might say that several of these articles have provided a lot of basis for litigation among lawyers. And some might say that's good, some might say that's bad, depending on what you think of lawyers. I saw a cartoon recently of a fellow who was walking through a cemetery, and he read a tombstone that said, a lawyer and an honest man. And he looked at that tombstone and he said, that's strange, two people buried in the same grave. <laughs> a friend of mine who's a doctor always likes to talk about lawyers, and every time he introduces me to speak, he always has to say, you know what's black and gold and looks good on a lawyer? And his answer is a Doberman. <laughs> to which my response is the Dobermans don't bite lawyers because of professional courtesy. <laughs> and I always have to tell a story about him, the time when he had diagnosed a patient as having terminal cancer and gave the patient 60 days to live. The patient couldn't pay his bill, so the doctor gave him an extra 60 days. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at Article 4 of the Constitution. Article 4 deals with relationships among the states. And Section 1 provides that each state must give full faith and credit to the legal acts that are performed by other states. For example, Alabama requires two signatures on a will, as do most states. Now, North Dakota requires three. So let's say that somebody who's half crazy, like me, living in Alabama there, executes a will and then goes to North Dakota because he loves those North Dakota winters, which I do, as a matter of fact. I'm a downhill and cross-country ski fanatic. And let's say that I die in a blizzard some July day in North Dakota. And so as my will is being probated, the judge says, oh, wait a minute, this will only has two signatures. And my probate attorney says, well, Your Honor, you see, this will was executed in Alabama, and Alabama law only requires two witnesses. So the judge says, well, this isn't Alabama, this is North Dakota, the will is invalid. No, under the full faith and credit clause, the state of North Dakota can't do that. If the will was valid where executed in Alabama, North Dakota must give it full faith and credit. Likewise, if somebody goes to Nevada and satisfies Nevada's rather quickie residency requirements for a marriage or a divorce and comes back to his home state, that state must recognize that Nevada marriage or divorce as being valid. Now, the exception would be that if a legal act performed by one state is very much against the public policy of another state, that other state might not be required to recognize it. We have an example of this going on right now that may or may not turn into a constitutional issue, but Recently, the Hawaii Supreme Court said that Hawaii's statute that prohibits same-sex marriages is unconstitutional. As a result, the Hawaii legislature may possibly amend its laws to recognize homosexual marriage. Now, let's say that two Kentucky homosexuals go to Hawaii go through a marriage ceremony in Hawaii, and then come back to Kentucky and say, we were legally married in Hawaii, you, Kentucky, have to recognize our marriage as valid under the full faith and credit clause. We might have a very serious constitutional issue there, and frankly, I think Kentucky would win. Section 2 provides that each state has to give each residents of other states the same privileges and immunities that they give to residents of their own state. For example, the state of Alabama establishes these fine universities like the University of Alabama and Auburn University. And if you know anything about the football situation in Alabama and the Auburn-Alabama controversy there, the only way I can tell people to envision it is just imagine 
Oklahoma and Nebraska being in the same state, and you've got a little idea of what Alabama's like. But let's say that Alabama decided, okay, only Alabama residents will be allowed to apply for admission to the University of Alabama. Under the Privileges and Immunities Clause, Alabama can't do that. They don't have to have any universities at all. But if they have a university, they have to give residents of other states the same opportunity to seek admission on the same qualifications as residents of Alabama. Same is true of hunting and fishing licenses. They don't have to give any hunting and fishing licenses at all, but if they do have a hunting season or a fishing season, they cannot restrict the licenses to Alabama residents only. Now what they can do, though, is that they can require non-residents to pay a non-resident rate that is designed to make up for the fact that Alabama residents have been paying taxes to support our institutions and to support our wetlands and so on. And to equalize that differential, they can require a reasonable difference in resident and non-resident tuitions or resident and non-resident hunting or fishing licenses. But they can't make an outright prohibition. States are required to extradite people when the governor of another state requests. Let's say, for example, that someone commits a crime in Alabama, and later he's picked up by the authorities here in Virginia. When our governor from Alabama requests that Virginia extradite, or that is, send that person back to Alabama to stand trial or to serve a sentence, then Virginia is required by this provision of the Constitution to comply. A couple of exceptions. One would be if Virginia already has a claim on that person. Let's say that person is also wanted for some criminal offense here in Virginia. Virginia can try that person, can make that person serve his sentence, and then send him back to Alabama after Virginia is completely finished with him. Or if it's capital murder here in Virginia, I suppose Virginia could try the person and execute him and then send his body back to Alabama to be prosecuted or jailed for 99 years, however they choose. The other exception is a governor may refuse extradition if he is convinced that the person will not receive a fair trial in the receiving state. An example of this occurred in a controversy a few years ago between South Dakota and California. South Dakota had a flamboyant and very popular Republican governor named William Janklow. California had a liberal Democrat governor by the name of Jerry Brown. Now, some years earlier, there had been problems on some of the Indian reservations in South Dakota that had resulted in some of the murders there at the Pine Ridge Reservation. And several of the leaders of the American Indian movement were wanted for those murders. One of them was arrested on a minor charge in California. And when South Dakota found that out, Governor Janklow requested that this American Indian Movement leader be extradited from California to South Dakota to stand trial for murder. Governor Brown refused to extradite. He said that there was such a climate of popular opinion in South Dakota that this AIM leader would not receive a fair trial in South Dakota, to which Governor Janklow was outraged. And Governor Janklow then promptly released several prisoners from the South Dakota State Penitentiary on parole and made one of the conditions of their parole that they move to California and establish residence there. <laughs> it made national news and Governor Brown protested, but by the results of the recent election, it's obvious the people of South Dakota loved it. <laughs> but things like that don't happen very often. Most of the time, extraditions are handled very smoothly by cooperation. In fact, it costs a lot of money to try and house a prisoner. And if another state wants to undertake that expense, most states are all too willing to comply. Section 3 then speaks about the admission of new states into the Union. It has a couple of restrictions. First of all, that no state may be formed entirely within the borders of another state. And secondly, that no state may be formed from territory, not entirely within, that can't be done at all, like right in the center of a state, but let's say take the west half of a state and make that into a separate state. That can't be done without the permission of that state's legislature. 
Now, there's one instance where that has been done. Anybody know where that was? Virginia and West Virginia. And the way that was done, of course, back in the day of the, of the war between the states, there was kind of a sort of legislature convened to give approval, and some say that that was not a legitimate legislature at all, but that's kind of the way that was handled at that time. Normally, that's not going to be a problem. Congress, then, Section 3 says, may make rules for the admission of new states into the Union. And normally, when a territory, let's say, like Alaska or Hawaii, seeks admission to the Union, Congress will pass an enabling act. And that enabling act will provide that, okay, you want to join the Union, here's what you got to do. You have to have a constitutional convention, you have to draft a constitution for your state, and that constitution must contain the following provisions. And they'll probably say it has to have a bicameral legislature, they'll probably say it has to have a Bill of Rights, probably has to be divided into three branches of government, various other provisions that they'll say that it has to consist of in order to constitute a truly Republican form of government. The territory then holds that convention, adopts a constitution. That constitution then goes back to Congress for approval. And if Congress approves it, then usually there is a popular vote in the territory as to whether they want to become part of the Union. And if they vote yes, then they are admitted as a state and a new star is added to the flag. Section 4 simply says that the United States shall guarantee to each state a Republican form of government. Now, Republican, you'll notice, is capitalized in the Constitution. And this does not, however, mean Republican Party. In fact, when the Constitution was drafted, we find that rules of capitalization were a little different from what they are today. Besides proper nouns and the first letter of first words of sentences, you capitalized words that you wanted to emphasize. It isn't that they didn't know proper capitalization, it's just that the rules were different and probably a little less formal in those days. We've already talked about the differences between a republic and a democracy. One concern that some have about whether we truly have republican form of government is the common practice right now of initiative and referendum. People popularly voting in a general election on whether or not a certain statute should be adopted if that is used very broadly, that might be more of democracy than of true republicanism. But as an occasional check on legislative abuses or legislative unresponsiveness, I think the idea of initiative and referendum is consistent with republican government and entirely appropriate. Section 4 also provides that the United States will protect the states against foreign invasion and against domestic insurrection. Then we come to Article 5. Now, Article 5, I think, gives us a clear demonstration that while the framers believed that they had God's wisdom and were applying divine principles to the Constitution, they did not consider themselves inspired in the way the authors of Scripture were inspired. I think the evidence of that is found right here in Article 5, which provides for amending the Constitution. There are no provisions for amending the Bible, and there shouldn't be. But the framers recognized that maybe we made some mistakes that you will correct later, or maybe there are going to be some changing circumstances that require some changes. So the framers provided two means for changing the Constitution. The first means, the one that we have used 27 times, is to have an amendment passed by two-thirds of both houses of Congress and then submitted to the states for ratification. And when ratified by three-fourths of the states, it becomes part of the Constitution. As to how the states ratify, Congress designates. Congress can say either you ratify through your state legislatures, which is the way they normally do it, or Congress could specify you ratify in state ratifying conventions. The discretion on that is left to Congress. Then there is a second means of amending the Constitution. And it's interesting, when you read the discussion in the last several days of the convention, you find that in Governor Morris's initial draft of the Constitution, he did not include any provision for a new constitutional convention. The route we just described, Congress and then ratification by the states, was the only means. But several delegates on the floor said, well, what happens if the people want an amendment and Congress is unresponsive? And so as a check against an unresponsive Congress, 
at the last minute and without giving it much discussion, they put together a amendment to Governor Morris's draft that provided that upon application of two-thirds of the states, Congress shall call a convention for the purpose of considering amendments. In other words, if the legislatures of two-thirds of the states call upon Congress for a constitutional convention, then a new convention takes place. Whatever that convention decides is then sent to Congress, who in turn sends it to the states, which again has to ratify by three-fourths of the states, whether by convention or by state legislatures, as Congress may determine. Now, we've never used the Constitutional Convention route, but we've come very close to using it several times. More recently, 32 states called for a Constitutional Convention for a balanced budget amendment. The remaining two states never signed on, and more recently, four of those 32, Alabama and Florida and Louisiana and Nevada, have rescinded their calls. Now, the drive is for a constitutional amendment for term limits. One of the reasons for going through a convention route on this is that congressmen themselves are not likely to pass this since it limits themselves, and so this may be the only feasible way. The danger that I see of the constitutional convention route is, first of all, we have no idea what's going to happen at that convention. Nothing in the Constitution, Article 5 or anywhere else, specifies how delegates will be selected, what rules and procedures the convention will follow. Congress may provide such rules when they call a convention, but we don't know what they would be or if they would be followed. One of my biggest fears is that we have no guarantee that the delegates to a convention like this would share the framers' view of human nature or their fear of government power. And so what they would come up with, I find, can be very dangerous. Nor do we have any assurance that a constitutional convention could be limited to a single amendment. There are those who think it could be, but I don't see any evidence of that. There are those who say you can make a contingent call for a convention. That is, say to Congress in your state's resolution calling for a convention, say Congress either pass a balanced budget amendment or call a convention. Problem is there's nothing in Article 5 that makes any provision at all for a contingent call. There are those who say that a convention call can be limited to one issue, who would say that a state or two-thirds of the states can issue calls for a convention with an express limitation saying this may consider only a term limits amendment. Again, nothing in Article 5 makes any provision for any kind of limited convention or limited call. Alexander Hamilton, writing in the Federalist Papers, simply says that there is no discretion left to Congress on this matter. Once the states have called for a convention, Congress shall call for a convention. Nothing is left to the discretion of Congress. That's what Hamilton thought as he wrote the Federalist Papers. Let's say we have a convention, and let's say they pass the Term Limits Amendment, and then as they're getting ready to adjourn, one delegate stands up and says, well, you know, while we're all assembled here, I think maybe we ought to consider a, how about a balanced budget amendment? Somebody else says, yes, and I think we ought to consider an equal rights amendment. Somebody else says, yes, and I think we ought to consider a right to life and a school prayer amendment. Then somebody else says, yes, and there are a group of us downstairs in the bar downstairs who drafted up a whole new constitution, and we think it's a lot better than the present one, and we think we ought to adopt this one instead. Can they do that? Well, the only precedent we have is the one of 1787, where a convention was called for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation, and we saw what they did then. So I see that route as being dangerous. And James Madison wrote in 1788, having witnessed the difficulties and dangers experienced by the first convention which assembled under every propitious circumstances, I should tremble for the result of a second. I think I can fairly say this, given the changed views of human nature today, this I don't think anyone would disagree with. If James Madison were alive today, he would turn over in his grave. <laughs> also, Article 5 provides that there are certain amendments that simply cannot be made. One, no amendment ending the slave trade before 1808. That would be unconstitutional. 
Second, any amendment that deprived states of their equal representation in the Senate. If we tried to amend the Constitution to say that the Senate had to be apportioned by population without every state that lost a senator by this consenting to it, no amendment like that could be made under Article 5. Article 6 then speaks about general matters. First of all, it provides that all debts and agreements entered into before the Constitution was adopted will be recognized as valid. Now, this was unusual because in most nations, when a new government took over, especially by force, one of the first things they would do was disavow the debts of the old government. And saying that we would recognize these debts not only shored up U.S. credibility with foreign nations, but also helped to restore national unity because some of this debt was owed to British sympathizers in America who thought that they were going to lose everything that they had loaned. And now that they found out that their debts were going to be honored, this helped to restore their loyalty to the United States. Then we have a very important clause, Article 6, Section 2, the Supremacy Clause. This clause simply declares, this Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. We call this the Supremacy Clause and it establishes that federal law stands above state law. But it establishes further that the Constitution is above all other. Notice the order here. The Constitution, there is your fundamental organic law. And then we have federal laws that are made under the authority thereof. Now what does thereof refer back to? The Constitution. These laws depend for their validity upon the Constitution because they are made pursuant to the Constitution. And the people have delegated through the Constitution the power to the federal government to adopt these laws. Had the people not delegated that power to the government through the Constitution, government wouldn't have the power to do that. And so laws depend for their validity upon the Constitution. So the Constitution clearly is more fundamental than state law or than federal statute. And then we see another interesting phrase. Treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States. Notice it doesn't say treaties made under the authority thereof, referring back to the Constitution. It says under the authority of the United States. Now, in a series of cases, Missouri versus Holland, U.S. versus Belmont, and several others, Justice Holmes and several others in the court have suggested that there is a reason for this, and that the reason is that the treaty-making power is not dependent upon any grant of power in the Constitution, but rather it's an inherent power that simply comes with being the sovereign head of state. I think there's some danger in that thinking. This theory goes on to say, then, that treaties, then, are superior to the statute, and that treaties are even superior to the Constitution itself. Because treaties involve the agreement of two nations and therefore can be changed only by agreement of both, whereas a Constitution is determined by one nation itself and therefore can be changed by that nation on its own. That is an argument that is made by many, possibly the majority, of professors of international law in America today. Most constitutional law professors, I find, take the opposite position. They take the position that the Supreme Court took in Reed versus Covert back in 1957, that if a treaty were superior to the Constitution, then we could simply amend the Constitution by adopting a treaty. Let's say we wanted to abolish free speech. All we have to do is make a treaty with Cambodia abolishing freedom of speech, and we've got it abolished. And clearly, that is amending the Constitution in a way that the founders did not intend. And so in this view, the Constitution must take precedence over treaties. You can put it this way. One, international law professors usually say treaties are superior to the Constitution. Two, constitutional law professors usually say the Constitution is superior to treaties. Three, 
the constitutional law professors are right, the international law professors are wrong, in my opinion, as a constitutional law professor. Well, why then did they say under the authority of the United States instead of under the Constitution? I think a better view is simply that they said under the authority of the United States because they wanted to include treaties that were made before the Constitution was adopted. The Supremacy Clause goes on to say then that the Constitution, federal laws and treaties will take precedence over state laws and state constitutions, that state judges and justices are bound by the U.S. Constitution and federal laws, and as the court said in a subsequent case, Martin v. Hunter's Lessee, a case in the early 1800s, that lower court judges should use the U.S. Constitution in making their determination. Many times I've been in court and found that a state or county judge says, no, I don't think I'm really qualified to deal with constitutional issues. I'll have to leave that to the Supreme Court. Well, according to the Supreme Court itself in Martin v. Hunter's Lessee, it is the duty of state judges to consider the Constitution in making their decisions. Article 7 then provides for the ratification of the Constitution. It provides that the Constitution would be effective when ratified by nine states. Now you'll notice that this really does an end run around the Articles of Confederation because Article 13 of the Articles provided that they could not be amended without the unanimous consent of all 13 states. The framers proposed this because they were quite certain Rhode Island would never ratify the Constitution, and it took them three years to do so, and then by only a vote of 34 to 32. Anyway, whether or not this was a legitimate means of ratification, well, Congress approved it, the states then adopted it. I can only say that it would be too late to entertain any challenge to it at this point today. Then they close by saying, done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present. And notice there are 12 states present. Rhode Island never was. This does not mean when they say unanimous consent that all delegates agreed. Rather, it means that each state voted to sign the Constitution because a majority of delegates from each state supported it. But as mentioned earlier, there were three individual delegates who did not. And then they close with these words. And just during our break, one of the persons present here showed me a letter to the editor that had been written in one of the newspapers here in this area, in which the writer claimed that our Constitution is entirely a secular document with no reference to deity. Well, I find it strange that very often when I see copies of the Constitution today, this last phrase is left off done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present in the year of our Lord, 1787, and of the independence of the United States, the 12th. That certainly is part of the Constitution. We are clearly referring here not just to God, but 1,787 years clearly refers to the birth of Jesus Christ. Unlike the French revolutionists who started renumbering their calendar based on the years of the French Revolution, the framers of our Constitution had no hesitancy whatsoever about referring to Jesus Christ and his birth as the central event of human history. <laughs>